We love you. Appreciate you. Thanks for being Same. here. Hey, be, uh, Cody's going to open the word for us. So let's do it. Thanks for being here. Thank you all. All right. We are going to be in uh, John chapter 13. John chapter 13. First, just a thank you for the invite. I'm humbled. I'm grateful. Uh, Y'all are one of our partner churches. Every Wednesday at noon, BSM does a uh, free lunch for any student that wants to come. Um, And a few weeks ago, y'all provided that meal for us. And so uh, many of y'all may not know that. I don't know. But y'all did it. It was a wonderful week, and um, it's a great time. So we're grateful for you. And and because of that, I'm your missionary. Um, BSM is an extension of you um, on the campus at UT as a... Uh, we see throughout the Old Testament as the people of God are roaming through Israel and they're trying to find their settling place, uh, waiting on a Messiah. We often see God's arm extend either out of Israel and provide or into Israel and provide. That's really my heart around BSM is that we are the extension that God's arm extending out of the church onto the campus to be his voice, his presence, uh, his comfort, his place of rest for anyone who needs it. Uh, so that means for some, it's, it's, it's students who are Christians. They find community, find a space of other Christians. UT is about 10% Christian, but not about 90% unchristian. That means there's about 45,000 students at UT who do not know the hope of Jesus' gospel and salvation. That makes the, the, the unchristian part of UT the third largest campus in the state of Texas, the third largest university. Largest being A&M at just under 70,000 enrollment. The second being UT at about 53. And then the third being the unchristian at UT. So uh, there's a lot of people who need, who need the hope of Jesus. And uh, we've committed our work and our lives to create environments where they can encounter Jesus Christ uh, in his resurrected form. <laughs> and we can worship uh, and, and then find hope and joy in it. So, so thank you. If it is your first time, I'll tell you right now, you've already seen Pastor up here. Um, and so I promise if you don't like my preaching, just come back next week. Uh, it'll be way better. It'll be way better next week. So, so come back. Don't give up on these people. Uh, they are a good people if you haven't already figured that out. But um, so, yeah, just thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm humbled and grateful. Let's pray before we open the word and uh, ask God to open our hearts. Father, we love you. I pray that's the loudest part of today's worship. Our gathering today is our love for you. God, we know you have provided the people in this room to reveal your love for us through them. Um, Father, I just pray our hearts be open um, to all the ways you are working this morning, through song, through prayer, through your word, um, through connection with other people, through a handshake, through a hug, through just a smile on someone's face. Um, We praise you for the gift of all those things. We know all of them are from you. Yeah, God, I pray that you continue to shape us and we walk out um, knowing you more clearly than we walked in. We love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Yeah, so Pastor said the last few weeks you've been working on some perspectives of connection and kind of the biblical mandate where we see God can God command us to, to live together. Um, and I find this topic, uh, especially of the connecting and the things that come from that, things like friendship and things like movement and things like uh, just, just purpose we find as we connect with the people of God. I find this topic like completely breathtaking. And, and there's a part of it that's like it's breathtaking because it's just really hard to talk about. We're not sure how to make that movement sometimes. Sometimes we just kind of hope we can sit in something and God will bring that to us and then we can define it as opposed to us having to work through a path, through a journey, through some type of action-oriented stuff and find God's, God's connection in our lives. Um, and and it's, it's, I'm, I'm overjoyed to get to kind of share some thoughts on that for my own life from the way we see it play out at BSM and in ministry, uh, and then predominantly from God's word. And of course, Pastor would say, um, hey, I want you to come talk about love, the most ineffable part of all of Scripture sometimes, the hardest thing to define, um, the thing that is, he has 10 people, what is love? You'll get 10 definitions. He's like, come talk about love. I'm going to go play with the kids. Have a good night. Um, and so uh, but I'll be on a side note, your pastor that gives up a pulpit to go play with kids and care for kids, that is incredible. I don't know if you know, you may be used to that. That's a rarity. Uh, I applaud that. So you should, your pastor gets much credit in my heart for that. So, um, so it's, it's wonderful. Uh, this idea, we're going to talk today about loving one another. Um, we'll look here in a second about Jesus' command, but it's one of those things that I find 
the easiest thing to do at moments, but oftentimes the hardest thing to do. I don't have like this middle ground on loving people. It's either I love you absolutely, or it is really hard to love you, right? Like it's somewhere, I, yesterday I met, you saw my little people over here, uh, my, my youngest son's 9U soccer game. So it's a bunch of nine-year-olds playing soccer, and there was one kid on the other team who was just drastically better than every other player on the field like he knew where to put his feet he knew like how to balance and lean and leverage he could slide tackle my kid's nine why does he look like messy out there like it's bad and i just found myself hating that kid i really did i'm just like this is not okay like this get him out of here like he shouldn't be playing he was on the other team and that's why but i I couldn't stand this kid i'm like put him in goalie get him off the field and they actually did he scored so many goals they put him in goalie and let have like mercy i guess but uh, I found myself mad at him. I'm like, you can't be mad at a nine-year-old shouse. What are you doing? And so I stopped and repented right there on the spot and, and said, um, God, I need a pass. I'm a parent. You know where that's coming from. And, uh, and he said, I got you. You're good. Go on. Just go love the nine-year-old. So I, we did. But <laughs> like, we did this real-life stuff. A couple weeks ago, I was reading. I read a bunch of random articles. It's just what I do. I, get, I just love reading culture and what's happening and and not trying to parse it, being amused by it more than trying to figure it out nowadays. But I came across this article a couple of weeks ago. This is what it said. It said, um, is this guy in, in, in England uh, who pretty much has a coffee shop. And um, two weeks ago, he released, put up a sign and said, um, no kids under 12 allowed. There it is. <laughs> Small coffee shop. He bans children from his coffee shop. No kids allowed. Like there are places kids should not be. I'll admit that. Coffee shops is not one of those places. Like, it's okay to have some of you are like, praise God for that, man. There should be no kids in coffee. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, kids, like, kids should be places. It's okay. But here's the, the best irony of the story. You can read the whole article. Dogs, they're okay. Dogs allowed. Children not. Like, it just felt like this huge, huge, un, un, like, tipping point that went the wrong, the wrong way. And, uh, <laughs> um... There are times, yeah, I don't want kids around, but at the same time, we need to understand that the world we live in does not revolve around just what you and I want things to be. We have to understand that there are times the world we live in and the way God has designed us, and if we want to connect with each other, there is an expectation of self-editing that has to happen. There is a point, we're going to unpack that self-editing idea in a little bit, but there is a point where we have to say the goodness of the larger... I may have to set some of my preferences aside. I may have to set some of them down. I don't know when it happened, but lately it just feels like loving your neighbor as much as you love yourself has become a sin as opposed to a command to obey. I feel like I get in trouble for loving my neighbor more than I get in trouble for loving myself. Jesus has some stuff to say about this. We're going to be in John chapter 13. A great passage. Um... We find, this, we find John, uh, Jesus with the disciples here, upper room, Lord's Supper. Um, and uh, in the point we're going to pick up in verse 31, it starts off, after he left, he there is Judas. Jesus has just said, one of you uh, will turn me over. One of you will turn me over. And as soon as I hand out the bread, he'll leave. So he hands out the bread and Judas, Judas steps out. <clears throat> That's where we find ourselves in verse 31. We're going to go through verse 38. When he had left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Children, with children, I am here with you a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new command, love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this very, um, yeah, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. <clears throat> then Simon, who always has something to say, Lord, Simon Peter said to him, Where are you going? Jesus said, Where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will be able to follow later. Lord, Peter asked, Why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus replied, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly I tell you, a rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. 
So we find Jesus in the upper room. He's just handed out the bread, just passed around the wine. They had just, he said, this is my body. This is my blood. He's just telling them the events of the next few hours. And he gets them to sit around. And the first thing he says is, I give you a new command. A new command. Why can he even say that? Well, that's what the first couple verses are about, 31 and 32. If you look at those two verses, you see the only verb Jesus uses in those two verses is the the verb glorified. He says, the Father will glorify me. So there's this transfer of glory from God the Father to God the Son. And then Jesus says, and through that, God will be glorified. So he says, so God the Son, being glorified by God the Father, will roll right back up and, and, and glorify God the Father. So there's this, like, there's this like deified loop of glory, this transfusion loop of glory, just transferring through the Father, through the Son. It's an incredible view of the Trinity, if you ask me. We actually see the Holy Spirit is the one who we know passes through glory. So it's actually a Trinitarian movement happened here. We see it again in John 17 as Jesus is in the garden praying. He says, Father, glorify the Son so the Son may glorify the Father. He says 31 and 32 so that he can, so he's showing he has an authority for verse 34. A new command I give you. See, if I walk into this room and say, all right, church, I got a new command for you. You're going to kick me out. And you should, by the way. If someone does that, you should kick them out. But, but see, Jesus sets up in 31 and 32 saying, I, I, I am the one who's like transferring the glory of the Father. He's giving him, showing himself as the authority to give new commands, to reestablish and the giving a new command is not new. Jesus has done this several times, right? Go back to the Sermon on the Mount, what, six times he says, you have heard, and he says some law, but I say. And he kind of takes that law and just pivots it like one or two degrees. It's not a huge twist. It's just a little bit of a pivot, just enough to really baffle the hearts and minds of his disciples and anger the leaders of the Jewish church, Jewish leaders at the time. Jesus is used to that little tap of the rudder so that the whole ship turns mightily. And this is one of those moments. It's one of those rudder tapping moments where he says, I give you a new command. Love one another. I got ahead of my notes, sorry. Um, Why why is this so difficult sometimes? Um, Sorry, context for it. Why, why does he need a new command? What is the new command he's giving? Love one another is not new. Jesus has said that before. Loving someone's not new. It's the way he's telling them to love. I won't, go nerd, I won't nerd out here on the Greek, but the, the, the Greek actually just points back to just a few verses earlier. Literally just go back to verse 8, go back to verse 4, and we find them entering the upper room. Go back to verse 4 and watch what he says. So he, being Jesus, got up from supper, laid aside his outer cloak, took a towel, and tied it around himself. Next he poured a water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with a towel around him. He began to wash their feet and dry them. Six, he came to Simon Peter, again has something to say, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, why, uh, what I'm doing, you don't realize now, but afterwards you will understand. Peter says, you will never wash my feet. Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And Simon joyfully says, then Lord, not just my feet, but also my hands and my head. See, in this moment, Jesus is saying, the new command I'm giving you is to not just do the things no one wants to do. Not just do the, see, sometimes we, 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 we pigeon and categorize this idea of Jesus washing the feet. Well, that's just something no one wanted to do. No one liked doing that. See, it's way bigger than that. N.T. Wright talks about this is an entire identity shift for the disciples of Jesus. See, washing the feet is not just something people didn't want to do. It was an act of shame in most Jewish households. It was the most shameful place. It was the guest would sit and take off sandals, and then the, the, the slave would get down below them and wash feet. It was a place of shame and dishonor. And for Jesus to take that position in front of his disciples, when you understand a rabbi-discipleship relationship, the, the disciple of a rabbi is saying, I am putting my identity in that rabbi. Whoever that rabbi is, that's who I am. Whatever he says, that's what I'm going to do. What others know him for is what you'll know me for. 
So when Jesus puts himself in this position of shame, Peter's like, no, 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 no. Uh -uh. Don't you, have you paid attention this last week? A week ago, we came into the city and they were like filling arenas, screaming your name. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Remember that? And all week long, you've been doing these miracles and doing these teachings. And as you've done it, people have come and crowded around you. Luke actually says at night this, during this week of entry to crucifixion, at night he'd go sleep in the, in the, uh, the, the, um, the Garden of Olives. And, and then in the morning, first thing at sunrise, the garden was full with people wanting to be taught by Jesus. All week long, the disciples have sat in this quasi-celebrity position behind this incredibly almost famous rabbi, Jesus, and they're kind of enjoying that position right now. We know Peter's history is part of the zealots. In other words, this idea that he is ready and postured himself in a militant way, waiting for the Messiah to overthrow the Roman government. Peter is getting excited. The moment is coming for this to happen, the one we have waited centuries for. And then Jesus goes from this position of quasi-celebrity in Jerusalem to a position of shame in front of him. This is horrifying for Peter. Don't touch my feet, Jesus. I don't want to be a part of that. My identity can't go there. And then what does Jesus say? If I don't watch your feet, you have nothing. You have no part of me. And when Peter realizes what he's done, then he's put his identity in these other groups that are huddling around him instead of in the Messiah himself. What did he say? Then wash all of me, Jesus. Wash all of me. This command that Jesus is giving is referring back to this moment. The command he's giving us is an entire identity shift. Don't just be the people who do what no one else wants to do. Be a people that, that take on the position of shame for the benefit of others. That's the posture of Christ. This call is to this, to this position of humility. It's how others see us. It's a give and get kind of thing. It's, it's this idea that, um, that Peter enjoyed the honor that it meant to be a disciple this past few days. But could Peter embrace the horror of what was about to come? The honor he'll take, but will he take the horror? It's also a call not just to humility, but to conviction. Understanding that Jesus as deity, Jesus as God, carries a standard and carries an expectation to hold his own holiness that we sang about to kick off our time tonight. And if Jesus is going to hold that standard, we have to attach ourselves to that standard. So we don't get to say, Jesus, don't take that position. I won't follow you there. Jesus says, I'm going here, and if you don't come, that's on you. And Peter chooses to follow. We must work from a place of conviction. So when we live in this conviction, this identity of humility and conviction, then verse 35 happens. By this they will know that you are my disciples. When we love others humbly, Jesus is seen. When we are motivated, when we are motivated by what we pour into the lives of other people, Jesus is seen. When our kindness is so great that it outweighs any expectations of situations, Jesus is seen. When safety becomes secondary and love becomes primary, Jesus is seen. And if we are disciples of Jesus, it is our job to take the position of the rabbi and learn from him and do as he leads. How do others know that you are a disciple of Jesus? Even more importantly, how do your friends know you are a disciple of Jesus? If I can take off the preacher hat for a second and put on the missionary hat, that means it's story time. It means I get to tell you a really cool story of how we've seen kind of these passages play out just in literally the last few months of the BSM, and this is just one story. Two young ladies, Daytona and Jamie, are roommates. They became friends uh, their first year at UT, decided to live together. It's worked out good. Not all friends being roommates works out well. You know that, right? This one actually worked out well. And so roommates, Jamie became a believer this time last year, January of, of last year, gave her life to Christ, became a disciple of Jesus. Daytona said, I'm glad for you, but I don't want to be around all that. She had a little bit of history of church hurt, um, and that's an understatement, a little bit. She had a lot of history of church hurt. She said, good for you, I don't want to be around it. As the new year started, um, the new school year started past August of 23, um, 
uh, Daytona realized that she was kind of lonely, becoming lonely. She had these friends she lived with, but it wasn't satisfying. It really was still a place of emptiness. But she saw Jamie, her roommate, had all these friends. And these friends like actually filled her up. Like they, they were the roots of her life, the place she drew a lot of nutrients from, but it was also the fruit of the life. Like it, the friendship is what came from who they were. Like she was filled and she had peace. And she had joy in her life. And they toned her in her loneliness and said, can I, can I just come hang out, but not the religious things? Like just when you hang out with those people, can I come with you? Jamie was like, sure, sounds great. So didn't invite her to any of the, the spiritual stuff we do, just hey, we're going to go play cricket, go play pickleball, we're going to get boba, whatever, whatever fun students do. They, go, they went and did all that. Um, Christmas break comes, and Daytona tanks. Loneliness just bottoms out. And she comes back, and she says, I need, I, whatever you're doing, Jamie, I'm going. I don't know what it is, but you're doing something, I'm going with you. What Daytona didn't know is a group of students that said, hey, we're going to kick off the semester with a night of prayer and worship. Um, so Daytona just says, I'm going with you. Don't even ask what it is. So she goes to a night of prayer and worship, and she sits on the edge, and it's very confusing. Very confusing to her. doesn't make a lot of sense. But what she does see that night is she sees a group of students who she has seen love each other well, have fun together, care for each other. When something bad happens, as much as they can step in, they do. And when they can't step in, they hand it off to someone who can. They care for each other really well. In this moment, though, at this night of prayer and worship, Daytona sees that there's something greater than the friendship, that they have, they have an affection for something greater than each other. She says, I've never seen that before. Now, Daytona grew up around church, hurt by the church, but she had never seen people that love each other so much that they actually love someone else more. And it's that affinity, that shared love for something greater that drew them together. She had never seen that. So on the walk home that night, Daytona has a lot of questions for Jamie. Jamie does the best she can to answer. Remember, Jamie's been a believer about a year, so she's new to some of these questions as well. So Jamie, being discipled by an upperclassman, calls her and says, I need you to come meet with Daytona because she's got a lot of questions that I can't answer. And they began to meet and read the Bible together for a couple of weeks. And about the middle of January, Daytona said, I trust Jesus. I don't trust the people that hurt me in the past, but I trust Jesus for whatever that means. And she gave her life to Christ in the middle of January. And that girl who met with her has been discipling her ever since. And she's growing her faith a little bit more every day. Why? because there's a group of people who loved each other just enough that they were identified as disciples of Jesus. When we love each other in a way of humility and conviction, it will draw other people to Jesus. <clears throat> now, it sounds easy, great story, Cody. I preach your back, hat back on. Well, it's a great story, sounds fun, good for Daytona, but this is hard. Like, this is not easy like I try to stand in the path of Jesus but something just continues to block that path and I'm not catching this so so some some things I just kind of thought what make this so hard what makes it so hard to live in humility and conviction a couple weeks ago we all experienced this incredible one of the most incredible natural things that happens where the moon passes in perfect alignment between the sun and the earth and everything goes dark we have that eclipse that we all saw happen or maybe not, I don't know. But we all know about it, right? And so you have this moment where you're trying to see the light and the light is completely blocked. What are some of those things that block us from living in that identity that Jesus is bringing us into? I think one, if you're kind of a head knowledge person, like you learn through, through knowledge and understanding, then I think language makes this understand difficult to understand. English kind of botches up this idea of love, right? Like we have one word that I love barbecue and I love my wife. God may it be that those two are not the same, right? Like genuinely. Um, but we only have the one word. Greeks are way smarter than us. So they had four words for what we would translate as the word love. The first one never shows up in the, in the New Testament, but it's, it's eros. The Greek word is eros, and it means love. And it's a romantic or sexual love right? And so uh, it's a real love. It's some people, we get the word erotic from it. I know in that, in our language, that kind of means gross and weird. It's not weird and gross to Greeks in the sense of this is, this is the kind of love that exists inside of a marriage. It's a sexual love, all right? 
Second is a word called stoge. Stoge is, is like an inherent love. It's what family members have. It's what a mother, it's a love a mother has for a child or a brother and sister have for each other. At least I'm told that's what it's called because I don't see it in my house. But they do, apparently there's a, and I'm an only child. So apparently a brother and sister have a love for each other. And it's a special, it's inherent, it's brought in by just this, this connection that you didn't create. It's, it's just kind of a bloodline kind of love. Stoge is the Greek word for it. It doesn't show up in natural form. It only shows up in the, what they call the negative form, meaning ostage, meaning unloving. <laughs> and so that's the only way Paul uses it in the letter to Timothy. It's the only time it shows up in the New Testament. Third kind is a word called um, phileia, which is, it just means brotherly love. It's the friendship love. Actually, the New Testament translates it as friendship. It doesn't translate it as love. It uses the word friend. Um, when we see Philea, we get Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia, we call it the city of brotherly love. That's where it comes, the same kind of root pathway from Greek to Latin to English to Philadelphia. So it's the same idea in the Bible, but it's translated as friend. This is the, and the last one is the kind of love Jesus is talking about. So what he says here in John chapter 13, and it's this, <clears throat> it's this love called agape love. And it's this transcendent, it's like it's the love God has for people. It's genuine. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, it's for God so agape the world. Like this is the kind of love God has for his people, has for creation. This is an unconditional love. There's no situation that can alter, adjust, knock off track, doesn't affect. It's an unaffected kind of love. When it is had, nothing can take it away. It's that kind of love. And every time it's used in the New Testament, it is translated love. 100%. It's one of the few words that has the same translation every usage. Um, but it's, a, trans, it's a, a, a transcendent kind of love. It comes from beyond us. It's not something we conjure. It's not something we can manipulate uh, inside of us. It is something that is given to us and we share. That is the kind of love Jesus is calling us to. It's the kind of love Jesus, Jesus spoke of. It's the only kind of love Jesus spoke of in all four of his Gospels. He only speaks of agape. The other three he never mentions. But sometimes in English we can screw that up. When <laughs> we say love is love is love. No, it's not. <laughs> there's eros, there's stoge, there's, there's uh, philia, and there's agape. Which one are you talking about? Jesus is talking about Agape. Another thing that I think can really distract us from living in a life of humility and, 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 and conviction is consumerism gets us. We are Westerners in the 21st century. We have been told, take all you can to get more. Consume everything you can so that you can have more of whatever you're looking for. You can continue to benefit over and over and over. Um, it seems we've found every way possible to profit, not just in life in general, but from the gospel itself. Somehow we've commodified the gospel, we've made it transactional, not just between us, but sometimes some of us, self-included, have turned the gospel into transaction with Jesus. I say that as a recovering legalist. I need meetings, for that. Like this, that's my struggle point. That gets in the way, that blocks us from seeing the light of the identity God's offered us through Jesus. The gospel is meant to, be, meant to be transformative, not transactional. All right? The last thing I think is disconnect. Um, I'm going to rush through this one a little bit but because it's, you'll, you'll know it. We all do this. I got to go to a retreat a few weeks ago, and an expectation of the retreat is you turn your phone in. I just turn it off like they took it when you checked in. Um, and there was a part of me that was like, the worst is about to happen at home. Like, I just know it. My wife, she's going to be stuck, and... It's going to be rough for her, but it's what I got to do. And so I turned it in, and for the next four days, it was incredible. It was incredible. And I came home, and I was telling a buddy of mine that, man, I turned my phone in for four days, and I didn't even worry about it. I couldn't, didn't, there's nothing about it whatsoever. And it was wonderful. He goes, isn't it so good to disconnect? And I got to think, and I was like, you know what? I didn't disconnect. I actually reconnected. <laughs> When I turned my phone off, I actually reconnected. I reconnected with a maker. I reconnected with those who love me more than anyone else in a real way, not in a virtual way. I didn't get caught up in things that are happening outside of me. I got to live where I was. I actually lived in a connected way when I turned my phone off. I think many of us keep our phones on, and that's what disconnects us, that we're disconnected to a virtual space and from a real space. All of these are things 
that, dis- that get in the way of us living the identity Jesus calls us to. Um, so how do we know if we're even loving each other? We, it's hard and these things get in the way. How do I know? Like, this is confusing. What am I supposed to do? All right, we're going to turn over to a passage you all know. If you've been to any wedding, you've probably heard this passage. Go over to 1 Corinthians 13. Because uh, I'm going to tell you right now, 1 Corinthians 13 is not a wedding passage. It's a discipleship passage, all right? It is meant for all followers of Jesus, not just a bride and a groom on a, on a wedding altar, all right? So 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to start in verse 1. And we'll go a little quick here. For your sake, not mine. Paul says, starting in verse 1, If I speak human or angelic tongues but do not have love, I am a noisy gong and clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and and if I have faith that will move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions and if I give over my body in order to boast but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it's not boastful, it's not arrogant, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not irritable, and it does not keep a record of wrong. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. Remember, agape is once it's put in place, it is eternal, it does not move. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they'll come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, they'll come to an end. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke and thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part but then I will know fully as I am fully known. I love that line, as I am fully known. What a place to be. And then 13, a powerful one. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest is love. Verses 1 through 3, we see Paul establishing love as like the greatest of importance in the life of a disciple. Without love, he says, you're a clanging cymbal. Now, we didn't have drums up here today, but you've been to a, a place where there's drums and there's cymbals. And when cymbals are matched with, with other instruments, with other pieces of a drum, with other voices and a guitar and keys and all the cymbals are perfectly fine. But what if Charlie got up next week and all he had was a cymbal and he leads you in songs, but all he has is a cymbal. He's tapping. You will walk out with a migraine and a bitter heart. Like you will be, clanging cymbals are annoying, right? Like imagine that and then forget it as quick as you can because you don't want to think about it too long. But if that's what happened, like clanging cymbals are annoying. They're annoying. And Paul says, if you don't have love, you're as good as that. You're as good as that, a clanging cymbal. Paul is establishing love as the bedrock, as the life of the disciple. It's what we root ourselves in. It's what holds us up. And if we don't have love, we have nothing, we gain nothing, and we are nothing. The best we can produce is annoyance. What a powerful idea. And then we drop down to verse 4 and 7. We actually see here that love is a spirit-led thing. If you read through these, you, can, you, you feel like you've heard some of these before. If you've read Paul's letter to Galatians and you get to the end and he gets to what we call the fruit of the Spirit, there's a lot of parallel here. Some of the same words and a lot of the same ideas. What Paul is saying is by your own power, you can't pull these off. You can't love people the way love is intended to do. You must have a love from outside of you that fills you and captures you so that you can share. That's that agape. And when we try to love that way on our own, by our own strength and by our own power, we are missing everything it's been designed for. Love is spirit-led. When we go to those last five verses, we see that love has, 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 has an eternal mindset. Love is intentionally living for heaven, not for earth. He's saying all these things you can cherish and, and boast in on earth, they will pass away. Everything we know in part, we will eventually know in full. We don't have it now. They will be gone. You can have hope and faith all you want. Use it. It's meant for, it's for benefit for the people of God. But there will be a day where hope and faith are not needed. Things will come to fulfillment and all we will need is love. Love is bedrock. Love is spirit-led. And love has a heaven-bent, a heaven-mindset. 
So what does have-alls have to do with connection, Cody? Let me give you these last couple things and we'll wrap up. I, I think we see it most clearly in the middle part of that passage in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4, uh, 4 through 7. The first part, love is patient, kind, and doesn't boast. We actually see here that love is willing and ready to self-edit. Going back to that idea that my preferences are not the most important thing in the room. See, a modern world promotes a lie that says whatever restricts me is, is unauthentic or weak. If I'm supposed to hold back, if I can't be the full me, that's evil. And whatever restricts me from being that, it's not good. That's what our culture tells us. That's why we kick kids out of coffee shops. Because when kids are in coffee shop, I can't be my authentic self. I have to edit language. I have to edit what I watch on my phone. I have to edit the music I listen to. I have to edit, you see where I'm going? That's why we kick kids out of coffee shops. It forces us to self-edit just a little bit. And the culture we says is when you edit, that's unauthentic. That must be bad. That's a lie. That is a lie. Love says, I'm so willing to be with you. I'm so willing to not be alone that I'll take some of my preferences and lay them aside because being, being with people is far better than being by myself. And I'd rather be as much as I can be with you than be by myself and feel like I get to be all of who I want to be. Because sometimes all of who I want to be isn't even beneficial for me. That's why we have a gospel. That is why Jesus took on flesh endured the cross, overcame death with the victory of resurrection, and that whoever believes in him will be brought into the same eternal life he has. Because some of the things we want are not good for us. We need to learn to edit. The life of a disciple is built around the idea of self-editing, transformation. Paul says it's, Paul calls it being transformed to the image of Jesus. Next, we keep on reading in verse 4, love is not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not irritable, it keeps no record of wrong. See, love is not centered on an individual, it's centered on a, on a, on a community, on, 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 a, on the group, on the collection. Friendships that mirror Christ, um, they, they have more than one person involved in them. See, somewhere along the way, some of us have been convinced that me being my best friend is okay. Me being my best friend, that's fine. And then I'm just going to surround myself with actions and ideas that supplement that. That supplement me being my best friend, what I like about me. And if I can get the right actions and ideas that lift me up, then people will come in too, and that's what they're going to bring. They're going to bring more actions and ideas that lift me up and make me like myself even more. We call this the entourage mentality. The idea that if I can just surround my people, surround myself with the people that make me feel better about myself, that's all I need. The problem with that is I'm in the middle of that. I'm in the middle of that. Jesus says, no, 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 get off. Let me be in the middle. Go join the community that is revolving around me. And that's where you'll find hope. That's where you'll find support. That's where you will be fully known, as Paul says there in verse 12. Keep going in verse 6. It says it, it, is, it takes no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Friendship is joyful. Like, oh, finally something good, Cody. Thanks. Uh, friendship is a joy. Now, we need to make sure we have the right definition of joy. Joy doesn't mean this unending happiness. Um, joy is not this, uh, uh, this idea that it is evidence of good health. It's not like I have the best POV reels on, on Instagram. Like, it's not just I'm showing you the best life. That's joy. No, 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 no. Joy is not the product of good life. Joy is what allows good life. Nehemiah said, it's the joy of the Lord is our what? Our strength. Strength is what we need to walk through life. Strength is how we get to the good place. Strength is how we, are in, how we endure, how we are sustained, so that, so that the life we really live doesn't drag us down, doesn't depress us. The joy of the Lord is strength. It's not evidence of something. It's how we get what we need. It is the support of what carries us. Uh, all right, last one. Verse 7, we see that friendship has a cost. It says it bears all things, it hopes in all things, it endures all things. Um, this is where we need that strength from joy. We need the strength that joy brings so that we can endure, so that we can bear, and that we can uh, have hope. 
in community with each other, for each other, the, the friends you prayed for just a few minutes ago. Why, how do we hope in that? We hope because we have the joy of the Lord, because we have love. Now, the beauty of all these things, of self-editing, of moving out of the self-centered life, of finding joy for strength and enduring a cost, the beauty is Jesus has done all of these already. He has already modeled how to do them. If you read Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, Paul writes, Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself. There's that self-editing. He emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. When we talk about not being self-centered, just go to the next verse in Philippians 2. It goes on and says, He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. You're dying out of obedience. You don't do that for yourself, gain. You do it for others. We talk about finding joy and strength. The very declaration of Jesus' coming was that idea. The angel said to the shepherds in Luke 2, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news and great joy that will be for all people. Great joy will be for all people. An enduring cost. We see... The writer of Hebrews tell us in Hebrews 12 that if we keep our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, the joy that lays before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus has endured the cost so that we can know friends, so that we can connect with our maker. 